were the insects which most often pollinated them. Another familiar group of insects was around then, but not as pollinators. They were hunters. The solitary wasps. Living with flowers was to have a profound effect on their descendants. As they became adapted to make use of flowers, some of these wasps evolved to produce a new type of insect, a vegetarian, not a hunter, and social rather than solitary, the honeybee. Some of the details are uncertain, but we do know that the family tree of the honeybee has its roots here, among the wasps. This wasp, a particularly big and beautiful one, which lives in Utah, is called a muffler, the sand lover. Every morning during July, the wasps awake from their sleep into a chilly dawn. Their way of life is very similar to that of their distant ancestors, which hunted round the shores of long forgotten seas. They wait in the sunrise until their muscles are warm enough to work. The cold has made them torpid, at this time of day, they're slow-moving and unaggressive. Later, their true character will emerge as they compete for nesting sites and food. Their prey is caterpillars. To hunt them, they're equipped with good eyesight, strong jaws, and a sting, all characteristics which their ancestors were able to bequeath to the wasp's relatives, the bees. However, they don't sting each other during the confused scrambling as their joints loosen up in the morning sun. Such mutual tolerance in a crowd is another quality which the bees were to put to good use later. July is a muffler's breeding season, when the mated females, working alone, prepare the burrows in which they will leave their eggs to develop. It's a simple hole in the ground with an enlarged chamber at the bottom, but the wasp prepares it with great care. Sometimes two females dig at the same hole. The mutual tolerance quickly breaks down. It's a useful labor-saving device if you can get away with it to take over a hole which has been dug at the expense of someone else's energy. The squabbling goes on until eventually each female has a hole of her own. Even then, neighbors live on uneasy terms. Once the hole is complete, the female hides it from neighbors and parasites and sets off to find prey. Before she goes, she flies around the hole to familiarize herself with the landmarks by which she'll find it when she returns. A good sense of locality is another characteristic which the bees inherited. The 
wasps' hunting ground is the grassland surrounding the dried-up pool where they nest. There, caterpillars are easy to find, if you're a wasp. She stings her prey accurately behind the head to paralyze it without killing it. You'd think there were enough caterpillars to go round, but the argument is the same as for hole digging. Sometimes it's better to let someone else do the work. The intriguing thing is that during all these skirmishes, the wasps observe two rules. No one gets stung, and the caterpillar is never damaged. Clearly, fighting is too dangerous if there's a chance of being killed, and a waste of time if the prize is useless to the winner. On these terms, everyone seems happy to join in. There comes a point at which the females break off from the fight and go hunting again, until one of them finds another caterpillar when the game starts all over again. her burrow she lays one precious egg and surrounds it with as many as ten caterpillars. The caterpillars are still alive. When the egg hatches, the wasp larva will have plenty of fresh food. The final closure of the hole is different from the temporary lids which the wasp leaves when she goes hunting. This time she vibrates the tiny stones into place until the hole is securely sealed. It's a technique which human builders use to settle ballast or reinforced concrete and it's well over a hundred million years old. When the job's finished, the female leaves, never to return. If the weather holds and the caterpillar supply lasts, she'll dig another nest or two, but at the end of the season, she'll die. After its short active season, the species lives on underground as the larvae 
of the next generation. This solitary way of life is followed by the great majority of wasps all over the world. Prey differs and the way in which they hunt it, but the principle is the same. Whether they hunt flies or grasshoppers or spiders, the solitary wasps leave an egg and a legacy of food underground and depart to die. This is a solitary insect too, but it's not a wasp. It's a bee, very like the first bees which evolved in response to the appearance of flowers. It's called Calites, and there are certain things about it which make it quite distinct from all wasps. For a start, it doesn't hunt for a living, it's a vegetarian. This species collects pollen from the male catkins of willow trees. To do so, it's evolved one of the crucial features which distinguish bees from wasps. Its jaws would be quite ineffective as a device for collecting pollen. Instead, Calites uses hairs. Some wasps are hairy, but the hairs are single filaments. Bees have branched hairs, the better to collect pollen grains. In a series of photographs taken with an electron microscope, not only the branching hairs, but the pollen grains themselves are easy to see. The inner part of the leg bears pusher hairs, shaped like nail heads, to clear the pollen from the branched hairs when the bee is ready to unload. Apart from her pollen collecting activities, Calites behaves very much like a solitary wasp. Within the hole, she leaves an egg with a food supply consisting of pollen and honey rather than caterpillars. There is one other thing she does which is specifically bee-like, apart from collecting pollen. As she leaves her hole, she marks the entrance with scent from glands under her abdomen. It's like a number on the front door. It helps her to find her way home and it warns other Kalites that the hole belongs to someone else. Because Kalites doesn't visit female flowers, it doesn't pollinate the willows, but as a rule, the pollen and nectar which flowers produce function as a bribe to attract bees which do pollinate them. Some flowers, the yellow loose stripe is one, produce not nectar but oil and attract the bees which are specialized to collect it. The oil gathers in little glands on the petals and anthers, neatly placed so that a bee collecting from them is bound to pollinate the flower. The electron microscope shows not only the detailed structure of the oil gland, but also the spade-shaped hairs on the bee's legs, which it uses to scoop up the oil. Yellow loose strife and the oil bee are a special case, rather different from the general run of things. The usual bribe, which is very acceptable to most types of bee, is nectar. It's well known that in their contortions to gather the nectar, the bees pick up and transfer pollen between flowers. What is not so widely known is that bees deliberately collect pollen as a food store for their young. Calites is not the only one. This species of Osmia, the mason bee, nests in wood piles or in holes in the walls of buildings. Her pollen collecting apparatus consists of hairs on her abdomen and another set of hairs on her legs to brush it off. After she has deposited the pollen, she'll add some nectar to the heap. Thank you. 
When she has deposited the last of the nectar, the mason bee turns round and lays an enormous egg onto the store. None of the pollen is wasted. It took too much effort to collect. The egg, too, represents a huge investment of her energy. Before she leaves it, she'll go to great lengths to make sure that it's secure. The best way to do this is to seal it up. She collects mud from damp ground nearby. It's not her first egg chamber, or the only one. She can make as many as seven or eight in succession, each with an egg and a supply of food for the forthcoming larva, and each securely walled in with a partition of dried mud. The series is complete. She closes off the hole with a final outer wall built from the same supply of mud. Two small horns on the front of her head serve to manipulate the ball of mud into place. The hole is finished off with the same care and dedication with which it was started. She might set up two or three more burrows, but then she'll die. Inside, the larvae develop, eating the pollen store as they grow. Their mother will never see them. Apart from being vegetarians, they are no different in their way of life from solitary wasps. Next spring, the adults will emerge and the cycle will start all over again. Osmia's nesting material is mud, collected in insignificant quantities from quiet corners of the garden. Another solitary bee leaves more visible marks of her activities, especially on rose bushes. She's the leafcutter bee. She doesn't eat the leaves. She removes neat round sections to use as nesting material. The leaf cutter feeds on nectar, and in collecting it, she pollinates flowers. This is a vitally important function of almost all bees. Without them, the flowers couldn't exist. Indeed, the bees wouldn't exist without the flowers either. By evolving flowers which produce pollen and nectar, plants invented bees. Parting with a few pieces of leaf for the bee to use in its nest is a small price to pay for immortality. Leafcutter bees organize their burrows in the same way as mason bees, with a chain of cells each containing an egg and a supply of pollen and nectar. Instead of using mud for the division, they chew and manipulate pieces of leaf the juices of the crushed leaves make them stick together as they dry.
any hole will do, even if it's not perfectly round. By lining it with leaves, the bee can create the correct size and shape for her cells. Like the other solitary bees, the female leafcutter bee leaves her grubs to feed and grow and goes away to die. Similar cigar-like nests are to be found in America too, but there the leafcutter bee has a special importance. It's not a native of America. It was introduced accidentally from the old world. Once in the new world, however, it quickly became indispensable to farmers. Thousands upon thousands of acres in the United States are used to grow alfalfa, known in Britain as lucerne. It was introduced as cattle feed and for its seeds. But at first, the seed production was poor. Then the bee arrived by accident and things improved. Now, alfalfa seed is a major cash crop in the United States, thanks to the old world leafcutter bee. The bees are taken to the alfalfa fields by the lorry load in bee tenements containing thousands of nests. From there, they spread out to pollinate the plants. Although its nectar is acceptable, alfalfa is off-putting to most of the native American bees, hence the poor seed production when it was first introduced. The stamens spring forward with a sharp click, hitting the bee under the chin as it reaches for the nectar, and the average native bee won't stand for it. The old world leaf cutter evolved with alfalfa, and it accepts the slap in the face as the price of a meal. It's a classic example of the close mutual adaptation between bees and flowers, which led to the birth of the bees. In the next step forward, the bees evolved a way of increasing the efficiency with which they could exploit flowers as a source of food. A female solitary bee must do all the work herself, leaving at most a dozen offspring to carry on after she's died. Cooperation was to be the answer in a very special type of family group. It produced a class of bees which are just as valuable to humans and to plants as the multi-million dollar leaf cutters. Early spring sees the awakening of the bumblebees. They're all fertilized females and they've spent the winter hibernating in some frost-proof corner. Now they must find holes in which to build their nests. There are many different species with slightly different requirements. But since none of them can dig, they're all looking for existing holes. A hollow under a grass tussock would do at a pinch, but a disused mouse nest is a favorite site. The other thing they have in common is that they all make a start early in the year. The first to begin nesting is the early humblebee. Just like a solitary bee, she begins by building a cell for her eggs and establishing a food supply. But there are differences. Her cell is made not from mud or leaves, but from wax which she secretes from glands in her abdomen. And the food store is honey, not in the cell with the egg, but outside it. She collects pollen too, to feed to her grubs when they hatch. Unlike solitary bees, a bumblebee mother doesn't go away to die. She stays to bring up her family.
At first, she works alone, but soon the first female is joined by others, her daughters. With their help, she can produce and rear more offspring than she ever could on her own. The daughters are prevented from breeding by their mother's dominating presence. This is a crucial step in the development of bee society. In their first few days of life, they concentrate on duties around the nest, feeding and caring for their growing sisters in the cells. Their mother still goes out foraging for food, but as the nurse bees develop into foragers, egg laying becomes her principal occupation. Soon she will be freed from other responsibilities around the nest. At present, she is still responsible for controlling the temperature. She does it by fanning her wings, and she still has to build most of the egg cells. But as her daughters, the workers in the nest, help more in its management, she assumes the throne to become a true queen bee. With the queen bee devoted solely to laying eggs and the workers rearing the young and collecting food, the colony can get more benefit from the available flowers. As the colony grows, its output of work and its income in food goes steadily up 